All right, we're getting off to a little bit of a, uh, a late start, but a few things going on. I want to welcome everyone to, this is the fourth time that we've done the Small Unmanned Systems Business Expo. Uh, first year we did it, uh, everybody told me that I was crazy or crazier that this wouldn't work. But it does work and it's a great venue for people to come and hear from professionals and learn from people who want to, let's say, uh, use this technology in positive ways and uh, try and do it legally. Uh, so I, I, well I know you're gonna, the speakers are uh, all experts. And I know you're gonna have, learn how to earn legally. There's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about what's legal, what's not legal, how to be legal, yada yada. You're gonna hear here how to how to do all that legally. And I, I you know, want to thank all the speakers that came out here to uh, speak at this thing. And I know that they're all busy people. It's a great uh, venue for them to come out here and help try and educate the community. We also we record all of the sessions, and the reason we do that is we put them on our YouTube channel later go and you can watch these and people go back years after and watch these uh, presentations to learn from them. Uh, I know that universities also use these presentations for classes. I hope to also in the future. We also try and stream it. We didn't get that working, but uh, you know, we'll do what we can. So a little housekeeping staff, you are right here at the Golden Gate Club. <coughs> I know the, the map might be a little hard to see. Um, those of you with yellow dots on your name tag means you get lunch, which will be over here in the Hawthorne room. Uh, if you don't have a yellow tag, you do not get lunch. <laughs> but there are other places to eat. There's the um, Transit Cafe, which is close by, the Walt Disney Family Museum is Cafe, the Bowling Alley, um, the Officers Club has a restaurant. So there are some other things around here uh, for you guys to eat. The other thing that uh, we'll need to know is tomorrow, there'll be a reception hosted by Drone Deploy and that will be at the commissary. And we'll go there between 5.30 and 7.30 and uh, there will be uh, snacks and, and drinks and that's uh, hosted by Drone Deploy. So what you're, what you're in for is 39 presentations, one discussion panel, we got 20 exhibitors. The, the product demonstrations, uh, it's kind of an insurance snafu that I don't want to get into. <laughs> um, so we may see one, the Fruity Shoots demo. Um, and then the SF Drone School is going to do a totally FAA compliant <laughs> drone selfie thing. So, you know, be, be on the lookout. Did you get the drone selfie, the FAA compliant drone selfie thing together? Yes. Okay, good. So be sure to uh, come by and check that out at lunch. And then um, that's pretty much it. Again, yellow dot, lunch. No yellow dot, no lunch. Oh, and then the other thing we're gonna do is uh, there's a hat out there near the poster on the table. You drop your business card in there and tomorrow at lunch, we are, uh, the nice people at Boomerang Carnets are going to raffle off a Phantom Vision 4. I already dumped 250 business cards in there. <laughs> so if I win it, don't be surprised. Okay. Um, yes, again. Okay, but we'll remind you again. But be ready for that tomorrow. I also want to thank our sponsors. Um, these people helped me put this on and helped uh, keep it at a price point where business people can afford to come, is which I, which I try and do. I really, uh, you know, at SUS News, our ethos is to try and educate the community. And uh, these people help us do that, so support them. Okay, now we're gonna roll right into the presentations and I'm gonna open the show as I usually do. And I'm Patrick Egan, for anybody who doesn't know me. Um, and I work with SUS News, and I hope everybody, everybody here read SUS News every day, religiously, <laughs> twice a day. Okay. Anybody who doesn't read SUS News, we have to talk. Anyway, okay, so I'm going to launch right into this, and we'll try and keep on the schedule here, because we have a lot of speakers. This, I, I got this from a, um, a UK newspaper, 
And I think what it, what it tells us is that we've got a problem. If 58% of the people polled believe that uh, drones freak them out, we're doing a poor job as a community of getting the word out there about what drones can do for the rest of us. And so uh, it would be nice if we could work on that. Part of uh, my presentation is going to be talking about that. I think that we have an issue with some of the claims. I'm in the news business and I see people out there in, uh, with news stories and in Twitter and all the rest of that. And it, the, it, it really starts to frustrate me uh, when I see people make these types of claims that are up here on the board. The 333 thing, we have like the 333 King. We have people you can rent my 333 until yours comes out. We have people that are offering 333 services that don't mention any of the legal stipulations. Oh yeah, come on down, get a 333 and you're good to fly. Uh, the consensus amongst people in the industry is, is that maybe, I'm always generous where I say, I don't know, what is there now, like 4,900, 5,000, 333s, and uh, talking to different people in the community, I think I'm generous when I say that maybe 20% of the people are in compliance. I know that other people think that it's less of a number than 20% of those people. A lot of people don't even realize you need a pilot's license, things like that. So we're not doing a good job educating people on how to, uh, how to do this legally. The other one is the FAA certified flight schools. I don't, I don't, I don't know that that's true. Some of the hype, the world's smartest drone. Uh, other people are self-proclaimed drone experts. I see them all the time hanging their shingle out. I'm the drone advocate. Well, you know, what do you know about drones? Well, they're neat, and I bought a Phantom, and I fly my Phantom around. Um, that's not really uh, expertise in my book. Another one, uh, it was another study that just came out. A lot of the times people liken drones to birds. Uh, which I think is a mistake. Drones are not birds. Drones are, are birds are organic. They have uh, an innate instinct to kind of try and survive. One. The other thing is they're not made up of metal. Birds don't have metal bones. So likening them to uh, drones, I think, is a little bit of a stretch. One of the last, uh, you know, studies I saw. Somebody threw a number out there that we wouldn't have a drone collision. One drone collision. 374,000 years of operation. I'm going to call BS on that one. The other one, I don't know why this keeps happening, but people want to do drone events at airports. And it's like, to me, it's stupid. We have a problem where we have drones at airports, and that's starting to freak people out. And the beauty of the whole drone thing is that you can do it as an off-airport operation. You don't need to be in an airport. And I, uh, I don't know if you guys, whoever follows me on Twitter, I'm, I'm out there and I try and tell people, hey, you know, you've got to, uh, you shouldn't be showing videos of you flying your drone at airports. Uh, but one uh, example would be the, the video from the Mexico City airport. People are like, ah, oh, nobody even saw that. 436,000 views. A lot of people saw that. And I'm sure that there's some people that want to emulate that and they buy one of these drones run out to the airport and fly it to try and get the same type of video. Very hard to re-educate 436,000 people. Uh, the, other, the other thing, people are making claims that they have products and apps and other things that are going to manage the airspace for us. Uh, the airspace management is a very difficult task, right? Some people have done uh, air traffic control. I don't think the cell phone app is reliable enough or certified for uh, air traffic control. We could, we'll probably hear more about that later. Um, we'll hear from NASA too on the UTM thing. And the other one that we always hear is technology always wins, and that's not always true. We're seeing here with what's happening with the, on the regulatory front that our favorite technology is not winning. I would say that uh, with the things that have been coming out lately, we're losing. And uh, it's kind of fresh heat. And a lot of people, uh, I, I won't associate with people I see as snake oil salespeople or people that are making false claims. And the reason that I don't is I don't want to give them any credibility as they're destroying the industry I want to be a part of uh, to deal with. 
a lot of the drone companies, there is no QAQC and they beta test with their customers. And then they come back and try and blame other people in the company for their failings. I think we've seen some of that in the community um, and we're going to see fallout from that. We are seeing fallout from that. And I think that the other thing is, is people don't understand that if they're in the drone business since the 2012 reauthorization bill, drones are aircraft. People have tried to have their feet in both camps and say, well, I'm like an amateur and these aren't aircraft and then when it suits them, I'm a drone pilot, yada, yada. Um, we got to work on our script. The other thing is the hype cycles, I think it's totally out of control. And I got my little skier up here, he's got a little GoPro on his helmet. And he's skiing down here towards the, the trough of disillusionment. I think that the community in some cases, whoop, sorry, has been almost its own worst enemy. I think a lot of companies planned and thought that the FAA was actually going to uh, make that uh, September of 2015 mandate and were shocked that they didn't. It started. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, you know, some of us have been at this for a couple of years, but I think people kind of ran out of money. And then the last, uh, right before the chasm, there is the registration task force. Uh, I'm not happy with what happened in the registration task force. I think that the 250 gram number was a totally arbitrary number that was pulled together by, uh, well, it was a Ministry of Defense report that talked about 250 grams could be fa fatal. That is true. On the task force, I don't think we had good representation because we didn't have anybody there that knew anything about engineering. Because there's a thing called material density. If I hit somebody with a 250 gram steel projectile or a lead projectile, yes, that could be fatal. If I try and hit you with 250 pound or uh, grams of packing peanuts, it's going to be hard for me to do damage. I do not think that that was taken into consideration for the registration task force. I had it out with some of the folks that were on the registration task force. They told me, oh, well, we wrote into the recommendation that the FAA could not use the 250 gram risk threshold in the future. And we're in polite company, so I won't tell them what I said. But fast forward into this micro arc, and 250 grams is like the established risk threshold now for the NAS. So I hope everybody enjoys their, you know, unregistered, uncertified, under 250 gram drone, because that's exactly where we're headed. 2016 for me is the year of intellectual honesty, and I've been putting it out there, and let me just say that I'm getting lots of pushback on that concept. I think we have to be uh, accountable as an industry. We can't be making false claims. We have to be responsible. We have to take the lead in our own future uh, with the other folks, the other stakeholders that are already in the NAS. That's another thing a lot of people don't understand in the drone community. We, I think we first kind of went through that when we were on the small U.S. arc. There's some veterans in here. Um, there are other people already in the NAS. You know, there's, there's the GA people, there's the 121 people, the 135 people. There's, you know, uh, hang gliders, balloonists, everybody else. And the NAS already has rules. So the drone community is kind of like, we're, we're the new kid on the block moving into uh, an existing framework. A lot of people don't understand that. Another thing I don't think they understand is that the, the FAA isn't like dealing with the city council or the permit office or something else. The, the FAA is charged with making the NAS safe. They have a lot of people, 50,000 people doing that. They have a huge budget. Um, they do a really great job with the 121, part 121 people, and even GA is pretty safe. So if we're going to want to get into that, I think we're going to have to prove as a community that we understand what that means, or we understand the, the seriousness of moving into a, a safe space. So, you know, I always tell people, hey, you know, you have to uh, think about the community or the business that you want to be in. I think that the registration task force, again, if you look at uh, this guy from Atlanta Hobby, since the, the uh, recommendations were released for the, uh, the task force, his business is down 70%. Most of the uh, consumer drone manufacturers I talk to, their sales are down. 
we, we've all read in the news what, what's going on with 3D robotics. Um, I think we're going to see more of that here in the future. The other thing uh, we have here is another uh, clip from the micro arc. I don't think that people understand what this means. They, uh, for over 250 grams, uh, they want to do some industry consensus performance standards. Some people that have been on ASTM and RTCA, which I participated in both of those processes, that has been going on for over a decade. I asked about this on the call. I said, well, who's going to do the industry consensus standards? Well, we don't know. We don't have that figured out. Okay. So I'm hoping it's not going to take another 10 years. But the thing is that, uh, that the really is the sticky wicket here is the manufacturer of the U.S. certifies to the FAA that the UAS, UAS does not, you know, failure mode, blah, 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 going to cause serious injury. I do not believe that people in the consumer drone industry, the OEMs, understand what that means. Certification. Or they probably would have not went along with this. I wouldn't have went along with it. I'd be like, whoa, this is, this is pretty hairy. Anyway, all of these types of mistakes are going to uh, lead us to what I believe is a no drone zone or a limited drone zone where it's going to be very hard to make money. I think that's another thing. When this S SFAR 107 comes out, there are a lot of people in the community that believe that we're going to be able to do whatever we want. You're going to be able to fly wherever you want, fly at night, fly beyond visual line of sight, and they're dreaming because that's not what's going to be in 107. So, I think that we need to uh, focus and not our message and also um, when we go out there and represent ourselves in the community. I think we need credible and qualified advocacy representation. I do not believe that this community has any qualified representation at this point. I think we need to manage the hype, uh, you know, with the drones. I think people uh, are making just wild claims and we can't deliver on those and I think that's going to erode our credibility in the future. I think we need to focus on a business um, or civilian use message uh, and really just get away from the military stuff. I've been talking about that for a while. Although with the military stuff I will say that if you watch what they're doing their airframes are staying pretty much the same. It's kind of the uh, let's say traditional aviation um, style. I think we need science-based integration. I've been beating this drum for a few years. The community or the drone manufacturers should put money or put up some money to do some scientific research to understand what the risks are to non-participants on the ground. Also to the GA community, what are the risks of these small aircraft hitting like a 172 control surface, wing, windshield, prop, um, I've, I've tried to talk to people about this, the manufacturers, I've suggested they put up, you know, some money. They all push back, they don't, they, well, the FAA is going to do some testing. So, okay, well, fair enough, but who do you want to ask the questions? Do you want the FAA to ask the questions, or do you want to ask the questions? I usually get a shoulder shrug, which tells me that people don't understand the FAA game. I see the companies spend a lot of money on sending people to uh, exotic locations all around the world um, to take drone selfies. To me, you could get those photos free on Instagram. It'd be much better to spend that money on science, but that's me. Global harmonization. Uh, we have to realize in Europe, they're, they, we, they have you know 5,000 certificated operators where we have 5,000 exemptions here. It's a little bit of a different process. The other thing is some of the stuff that happens over here migrates to other parts of the world, whatever the FAA does, most of the other CAAs follow suit. Um, that's another uh, dangerous proposition for the people over there because they're already flying. Um, I do talk to some CAA people from Europe and they're like, well, should, you know, there's talk that we should follow the 250 grams. I don't know if you want to do that. The other thing I've been uh, beating the drum for a long time is regulatory accountability. I think people are afraid to uh, ever really publicly say anything about the job that the FAA is doing. I've said it over the years. I've, I've been a little harsh on the FAA, but uh, after all, I believe they kind of work for us and that the integration process should be a two-way street. 
some people that worked at the FAA have uh, felt my wrath. <laughs> Bruce over here was the uh, industry co-chair on the uh, small UAS arc. And uh, I gave you probably 10 months of hell, <laughs> Bruce. I had a full head of hair back then. <laughs> exactly. And it wasn't anything personal, uh, but you know, Bruce was representing the FAA at the time, worked at the UAPO office. And me as a business guy came in there and I'm like, hey, you know, this process is really slow. Uh, we're frustrated. Um, and so Bruce kind of educated me on the mechanics of, of how the FAA works. Um, that was his job. So we're, we're, we're buddies, but at the time, it was, uh, it, Bruce was definitely in the hot seat. Uh, <laughs> The other thing, you know, the thing I've been preaching for a long time is I'm into this. People are like, well, you know, what's the Zegan guy's angle? My angle for this thing has always been to advocate for small business and to create jobs. And through the, I don't know, 12 years that I've been doing this or so, um, I've seen a lot of people, you know, lose their businesses, lose their houses, lose their marriages. Uh, they put everything that they had into this business and kind of have sat there and, and watched it all kind of dry up and go away. And the real sad part of that is they've watched illegal operators go out there and make a boatload of money. And they've watched illegal operators, you know, get pull the plumb uh, and work and do movies and TV or sell their companies for millions of dollars or get VC funding. And uh, that's the real sad part. There's been a lot of people that have been hurt by this. And uh, so anytime anybody might ask you why, why I'm like a, a uh, let's say, vocal advocate or I'm maybe a little harsh to some people, that's my focus. And anybody that I see that's out there diminishing the viability of this uh, technology, um, you're going to hear about it. I don't have a problem with people making money. I just have a problem with people making money, let's say, um, and destroying this industry for the rest of us. So that's all I've really got to uh, say this year. I don't really have any words of encouragement. I am waiting for supposedly the uh, the SFAR is going to come out in a month or two, is what they were saying. I don't think that if it, when it comes out that all the parts and pieces will be there and we'll be ready to go and uh, the starting gun will be fired for the drone rush. But, uh, you know, I remain optimistic after 13 years that uh, we'll get something we can use. The other thing I wanted to talk about today is uh, Eileen's here from Monarch. And I thought this was a really great idea. She wrote this children's book, Daisy Saves the Corn. And it's this nice, good, wholesome story about how a drone is actually out there doing something good for the rest of us, helping feed a hungry world. And were you able to bring any copies for sale? They're out on the table. So uh, this might be something if you have uh, a little person in your life, this might be something you might want to buy and share with them or also even share with your friends. Uh, I think it's a great idea. And uh, you, you're working on another one, right? With Daisy does search and rescue or Daisy saves the, Daisy saves the day? All right. Uh, this is a good example, I think, of what we need more of. You know, we need to get out there and show people that, that we're not trying to spy on them uh, with our drones.